Today on the John Ankerberg Show, we will answer important questions about end times prophecy. Do ISIS and Iran have anything to do with end time events? When will the tribulation begin? And how long will it last? Which nations does the prophet Ezekiel predict will come against Israel in the last days? And is it possible that the Antichrist will be a Muslim? What about replacement theology? Has the church really replaced Israel as the recipient of God's promises and blessings? Will the Jewish temple be rebuilt on the Temple Mount before Jesus returns? And will America be involved in the Battle of Armageddon? Today, you will find out. My special guests are Dr. Mark Hitchcock, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary. He is the author of 30 books on Bible prophecy and is the senior pastor of Faith Bible Church. And second, Dr. Ron Rhodes, president of Reasoning from the Scriptures Ministries, who also teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary and is the author of 70 books on prophecy. We invite you to join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program, I'm John Ankerberg. Thanks for joining me today. We have a very fascinating discussion that I think you're gonna to wanna to hear. You realize there's a lot of things happening in the Middle East. There's a lot of turmoil and fighting, and it seems to be increasing. People say, you know, doesn't the Bible have something to say about what's gonna happen in the future in the Middle East? And it does. And specifically, it talks about two great battles that are gonna take place in a time period the Bible calls the Tribulation. And I want to talk about these two battles today and what the Bible says and the nations that are going to be involved. It is very, very interesting and uh, I think you'll find it fascinating as we talk about it. Mark, I'm going to ask you to define the first one and Ron, the second one. The first one is called the battle that is found in Ezekiel's prophecy in chapter 38. So a lot of people call it the Ezekiel 38 war. What in the world is that? Sometimes people call it the Ezekiel 38 war. Sometimes it's called the, the Gog and Magog war. And what it describes is sometime er, right before the tribulation period begins or early in the tribulation, there's differences of opinion about the timing of it. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. But what it describes is a confederation of nations that come into the land of Israel in an attempt to wipe out the Jewish people, uh, to destroy them once and for all. And of course, we see a lot of anti-Semitism in the world today, and we see Israel surrounded really by a, a sea of enemies. Uh, but the Bible gives the specific nations and gives us a little bit of a few clues about the timing of this invasion when this vast horde of nations will pour into the land of Israel in the end times. Yeah, and we're going to look at the nations that are named in terms of the geographical area and put names to the nations that are there now in just a moment. And we're also gonna talk about what happens in that battle. But there's another battle, and it's not the Ezekiel 38 battle, it's the Battle of Armageddon, which almost everybody in the world has heard about, but very few know what it actually is. What is it, Ron? Well, it's interesting that some people try to equate Armageddon with the Ezekiel invasion, and they're not the same. They're, they're very distinct from each other. Now, Armageddon is both a place and an event. The place is 60 miles north of Jerusalem. It's the Mount of Megiddo. And that mount, along with the Valley of Jezreel, is where all the armies of the world will converge against Israel. And there's a number of things that unfold in relation to Armageddon. It's not one battle. There's a series of battles. And some of the highlights would include the fall of Jerusalem, the destruction of Babylon, and the Antichrist forces moving against the Jewish remnant in the wilderness. And so again, it's not a single battle, it's a series of battles, and it happens pretty quickly, and it's probably the most violent uh, series of battles ever to come upon man. All right, I want to read from the Bible, first of all, about the Ezekiel 38 war, and then we're gonna comment about the nations that it uh, speaks about. The Bible says, Ezekiel chapter 38, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say this, thus says the Lord God, Behold, 
I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer with all its troops, Beth Togarma from the remote parts of the north, with all its troops and many peoples with you. Guys, let's define who are these nations because when Ezekiel was making these prophecies, the names that he mentioned, these people lived in certain geographical areas of the world. And I think what God wants us to do is who are the nations that are there now or will be in the future and these folks are supposed to come against Israel. Take us through the list, Mark. Yeah, the names have changed many times over the millennia of these places, but we're looking, yes, where were these ancient places in Ezekiel's day? What's the modern counterpart uh, there to these places? Uh, the first name that's mentioned here in this passage is Gog, and Gog, I believe, is the leader of this invasion. Now, I don't think that will literally be his name. The word Gog means high or exalted. It probably speaks of the way he views himself. He's prideful and arrogant. Uh, and Gog is not the same, I, I believe Gog is not the same as the Antichrist. I think the Antichrist will lead that final battle of the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon. Uh, this is a, another person who will be leading this invasion. And it mentions Magog. Uh, Magog is the land of the ancient Scythians. It was uh, the southern part of what used to be the old Soviet Union. Um, many of the nations there today, you know, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, these are, you know, they all, uh, we can call them the stands, if you will. They all end mm -hmm. in Stan, could include Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. About 60 million Muslims uh, live in uh, that part of the world today. Magog is mentioned. Uh, Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, and Togarma, four of the places mentioned here are places that are in the modern day nation uh, of Turkey. Um, Persia uh, is modern day Iran, became Iran in uh, 1935 and then in the late 70s became the Islamic, Islamic Republic uh, of Iran. Another nation mentioned is Ethiopia in some translations, but actually it's the word Kush. And Kush was the nation to the south of Egypt, which is the modern day nation of Sudan, uh, which uh, northern Sudan, at least today, is, uh, is a radical uh, Islamic nation as well. Um, so there's a lot of, of various places that are mentioned here in this passage. Also put which uh, was the ancient nation to the west of Egypt, which is modern day Libya. So it, it's quite a, quite a picture here. And to think that over 2,500 years ago, Ezekiel marked out these nations. And these are many nations that are in the headlines today and nations that are in opposition to Israel. And one other nation that's mentioned here that's not an Islamic nation is, is Rosh or Rosh which uh, we believe is uh, the modern nation of Russia. Yeah, so if the list goes like this, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Sudan, Libya, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, possibly Afghanistan, Algeria, Tunisia, and many nations with them, this is a very specific kind of group that are named, and they're gonna form a coalition, and the Bible says they're gonna come against Israel. Right. Now. What starts this? Well, evidently these nations uh, are gonna be um, kind of sitting back and watching as the Antichrist and the tribulation begins. He's gonna make a covenant with Israel, some type of guarantee of peace. And the Antichrist will be a, a, a Western leader, I believe, in a, from a reunited Roman Empire. Uh, we could call him kind of uh, the king of the West, if you will. When he makes this treaty with Israel, guaranteeing Israel's peace, Israel's going to let her guard down, it seems, at some point in time. Because Ezekiel, when we read on in verse 8 of chapter 38 and verse 11, says Israel is at rest and living securely. And it seems that it's possible that while they're under this guarantee of security from the West, this coalition of nations come against Israel. And it may be that they're coming against Israel, certainly to attack Israel. It says they come to, to uh, take spoil. Um, Israel is very wealthy now in natural gas. Some large reserves have been found there in oil. 
Uh, but also it says they come to cover the land like a cloud. They're, they're coming to destroy the Jewish people. But it may be, if it's during this time when Israel is in league with Antichrist, it may be that they're coming as well to come against the Antichrist because obviously then an attack on Israel, if they have a covenant with Antichrist, would also be an attack against him. So that could be some of the things that kind of precipitate uh, this this war of Gog and Magog. Yeah, and Ron, you have a very interesting observation. It goes with Ezekiel 39, 9. It says about this battle, Then those who live in the towns of Israel will go out and use the weapons for fuel and burn them up, small and large shields and bows and arrows, the war clubs and spears. For seven years they will use them for fuel. Now, this, we didn't say what happens to these armies. Let's talk about what happens to these armies, and then I want to get to this verse because you have an interesting observation. What happens at this battle when they come against Israel? Well, first understand that there's no possibility that Israel could defend itself against this massive right. army. I would encourage those who are viewing this television show to look on a globe and look at Israel, which is very small, and look at all of these big nations surrounding it. It's going to be a massive coalition of nations moving against Israel. Now, of course, God never slumbers, and He has His eye on Israel. So He is Israel's protector. And the text of Scripture indicates that God Himself will take out and destroy these invaders. And He does it by a massive earthquake. He does it by causing infighting among the troops. It could be that uh, they suspect each other of double-crossing each other. Perhaps the Muslims suspect the Russians of double-crossing double, uh, crossing them, and they start firing at each other. There's also going to be the outbreak of disease and also the, uh, the outpouring of uh, hail and fire upon uh, these, these various Muslims. And the thing of it is, is that uh, when God takes this army out, God's going to give a tremendous witness to Himself, kind of like in the book of Exodus. Because in the book of Exodus, God said, they shall know that I am the Lord and there's no one like me in all the earth. You see, God says similar things in regard to his deliverance of the Jewish people from this massive invading coalition. Yeah, he says, all the nations will know that I am God. That's right. And probably many people will convert to Christ as a result of that. All right, now back to this deal. When this happens, all the weapons are laying on the ground and Israel gathers them up and it says they're going to try to burn these weapons, but it'll take them seven years to get rid of them. Now, the reason why this is a big issue is that it affects the timing of this invasion. Right. And to tell you the truth, different Bible scholars have different views on this. Yes. Some will say that Israel needs to be able to finish burning those weapons by the midpoint of the tribulation, because at the midpoint of the tribulation, the Antichrist moves into Jerusalem, and any Jew that lives in Jerusalem has to get out quick, and they go into the wilderness. So the idea there is that maybe this invasion must take place perhaps three and a half years before the tribulation. Others place the invasion right at the beginning of the tribulation so that the weapon burning will be done by the end of the tribulation. And then still others place it closer to the midpoint of the tribulation. The problem with that, of course, is that, you know, what do you do with the burning of weapons? Does that go into the Millennial Kingdom, for example? Mm -hmm. So there's just a lot to consider in regard to the timing. But one thing is certain. Ezekiel says it happens in the latter days or the last days. So it's, it's, it's in very close connection with the tribulation period. Yeah. We go back to this thing of the, the whole tribulation has to start, though, with the signing of the peace treaty. So the question is, is there a foreshadowing of this war even before that happens, or does the signing have to start first before these guys can even assemble? Well, I think today we do see the stage being set. We see a lot of, a lot of alliances between these nations. Many of these nations despise Israel. They would jump at the chance to attack Israel. Uh, Russia is, is uh, really cozying up a lot with Iran, with Turkey. We see a lot of impetus today for peace in the Middle East. Uh, with all the, the chaos that's over there with ISIS and with others, there's a great yearning for peace in the Middle East. So we can see very easily in our world situation today, if the rapture were to take place and there were to be kind of a time of further preparation after that, that you would have this man come along who's going to bring some kind of peace there to the Middle East, to that chaos, while Israel's living in this time of security 
these enemies of Israel would jump at the chance to come uh, against Israel. So what we see today is certainly strikingly foreshadows what is predicted in the Bible. And remember, this was 2,600 years ago that this was written, almost, almost 2,600 years ago that God wrote these things. And, you know, it, it reflects and mirrors what we see in our world today. Yeah. And you know, the thing is, is that people back in Ezekiel's day may have wondered what those nations had in common mm -hmm. to make them want to attack Israel because they're not right next to each other. These nations are scattered about, so what would they have in common? And so back then they wouldn't have known that today we do know because most of these nations are in fact Islamic with the exception of Russia. Yeah, and I think too, Ron, we've got to come back to the Bible says about this war, one of the reasons that Russia and this coalition of nations will come down is because Israel thinks they're living in peace and safety and the, and the protection is down. Right, well there's different opinions as to what makes that peace and safety. You know, what, what about the unwalled villages and all of that? A lot of debate goes on there, John. Right. There are some people who think that maybe Israel is now in peace in the sense that she has a very strong military, a very strong air force, and is able to dispel any attack against them. There are others that say that this peace is based upon the covenant that the Antichrist signs with Israel. Both of those are good options, but no matter what you decide on those two options, you've also got to, to decide what to do with the, the seven years worth of burning of weapons mm -hmm. because your timing will affect that as well. Mm -hmm. And so what you want to do is to make sure that you give consideration to all of these details when determining the exact timing. One benefit of this idea that the invasion takes place before the tribulation is that that might in fact make it easier for the Antichrist to solve the Middle East crisis. If the armies that invade are basically taken out, then maybe it's easier at that point to guarantee the security and the safety of Israel. And to establish his worldwide power. Right, and keep in mind also that with the emergence of the false religion during the tribulation period, there are two big people groups that would stand against that. Christians would stand against it and Muslims would stand against it. Now, if the rapture happens before the tribulation period, they're removed. The Christians. The Christians are. And if this invasion into Israel takes place either before the tribulation or right at the beginning of it, well, that people group is mainly taken out as well. To me, that makes it much easier for the emergence of the false religion and even for the, uh, the Antichrist to come into power. Yeah, what's interesting is we can see the foreshadowing of that with a coalition of nations already forming that's got one idea, they want to destroy Israel. Well, that's right, and it might surprise you to know that there's already a precedent that's been set between Russia working with all those nations against Israel. Yep. It happened back in 1967 during the Six Day War. Uh, the Russians were ready to move in. And that's when President Johnson sent in the Sixth Fleet to stand with Israel and Russia backed down. And then back in 1973, when uh, Syria and Egypt and some other nations were invading Israel, they were doing it with Russian strength, Russian weapons and Russian intelligence. And then likewise in 1982, Menachem Begin and his people discovered an underground storehouse of Russian weaponry prepositioned in Lebanon for a ground invasion into Israel. So all I'm saying is the precedent has already been set. The idea of the Russians working with these nations is nothing new, but it will take on a whole new meaning in this future war. Yeah, shows how close we might be getting to that time period. And just like when you see signs of Christmas, when the Christmas trees start going up in the store and you start seeing all the wrappers, and uh, tinsel and so on. If you know Christmas is coming, you know Thanksgiving is even closer. And if we can see signs of the tribulation and the rapture has to take place first, the rapture is gonna even be closer to us than we might be thinking. All right, we're gonna take a break. We come right back, we're gonna talk about the second battle that happens at the end of the tribulation, the Battle of Armageddon. What's that all about? Stick with us, we'll be right back. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, Five Great Debates of the End Times, the three programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of only $49. And you may order this series now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030.
All right, we're back. We're talking with Dr. Mark Hitchcock and Dr. Ron Rhodes, and we're talking about the events that God says are going to happen after the rapture, during the time of the tribulation, when we come to the wrap-up of things in the world, what are the events that are going to take place? We're talking about the two great battles. We just talked about the Ezekiel 38 war, and now we're going to talk about the Battle of Armageddon. But things happen in between in this seven-year period of time. Give us a summary, Mark. Well, yes, the, the next event on God's prophetic calendar, as we've said, is the rapture of the church. We believe when all believers who are on the earth will be caught up to be with the Lord, an Antichrist figure is going to arise after it out of the chaos, make a treaty with Israel. Um, with that guaranteed peace, I think there's going to be this group of nations, Ezekiel 38, that we've talked about a coalition of nations going to come against Israel. It will also be an attack against the Antichrist. With them taken out of the way, then those armies will be destroyed in Israel. It's going to leave a great power vacuum that the Antichrist then will come and fill. Uh, during the rest of this time of tribulation, there's going to be a series of judgments uh, that are poured out upon the earth. The Antichrist is going to establish his global kingdom, a, a one world economy, a one world religion, a one a world political system. And all of these things are going to be happening. But when we get near the end of the tribulation period, there's going to be one last all out attack by energized by Satan to bring the whole world against the land of Israel, uh, to come in and to, to try to wipe them out once and for all. And that's called the battle or sometimes called the campaign uh, of Armageddon. Two great events will culminate the time of the tribulation, this campaign of Armageddon, and then the second coming of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I always like to think of Antichrist first as this great, smooth-talking, slick, political leader that's gonna have the charisma to persuade the world to follow him. We've had examples in the past of leaders mm -hmm. that could get the world to follow him. And I think he's going to be a political leader that's going to be able to pull this off, especially in the midst of chaos, but he's also going to be empowered by Satan and he's going to bring a spiritual deception as well. But now we get toward the midpoint and in this last part of the tribulation, what makes him take or try to persuade the armies of the world to come against Israel and finally destroy her? Well, you know, Israel is the people of God. It's from Israel that uh, we were given the Savior. Christ himself is a Jew and uh, he provided salvation for all people. But one thing we know from Scripture is that Satan is anti-God. He is anti-Christ and he is the one that motivates and energizes the Antichrist to do what he does. So yes, he wants to destroy the Jewish people during the tribulation period. And right there at the Mount of Megiddo, about 60 miles north of Jerusalem and at the Valley of Jezreel, all the armies of the earth will gather against Israel. And John, I hate to say it. I really hate to say it, but that includes the United States. You know, it's very clear from Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 14 and Revelation 16 that all the nations of the earth, all the kings of the earth, including presidents, will gather against Israel. In one sense, it's easy to see because if all the Christians on earth are raptured out at the beginning before the tribulation begins, that changes the way people think in America as well as other parts of the world. So that becomes a distinct possibility. That's right. And these forces, you know, begin moving against the Jewish remnant and they see it coming. And the blindness, the spiritual blindness of Israel is removed. They finally definitively recognize that Jesus truly is the divine Messiah. They cry out for deliverance and their deliverance comes from Jesus himself at the second coming. Uh, I hope it's videotaped. I, that thing's gonna go viral. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the second coming happens, what happens to the armies of the world when Jesus comes? Well, you know, uh, the book of Revelation says that Christ has this sword coming out of his mouth and not, that's not literal, but it indicates by the power of the spoken word, Christ will defeat all the enemies. Some people put it this way, drop dead. And it's that simple. Christ merely has to speak the word and all the armies of the Antichrist are dead. And of course the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. Uh, you know, soon after Satan is put into the abyss for a time, but a thousand years later, he too will be thrown into the lake of fire where the text says that the Antichrist and the false prophet are still burning. They've not been wiped out, they are still burning. So God is going to bring about ultimate justice in the end. Yeah, Mark, for those who do not know Christ, who do not want to go through any part of this tribulation, the Bible has promises for them. If we put our faith in Christ, how can they put their faith in Christ? 
Well, there's a great verse in the Bible that says, God made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. Well, what a transfer that is. He takes all my sin and I get all of his righteousness. And that happens when we simply believe in him, we trust in him, and we call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And I pray that every person who's watching, um, every person who's listening will realize that they're a sinner and that they need a Savior and that Jesus Christ is the Savior they need and they'll put their faith and trust and their hope in Him. Yeah. Next week, folks, we're going to talk about why the rapture is a different event from the second coming. Why they're separated by a period of time, this tribulation in between. It's because the Bible gives us irreconcilable differences about what happens at each event. So you have to draw that conclusion. We're going to show you the verses. It's what the Bible says that has brought us to these conclusions. We want to share those conclusions with you. So I hope that you'll join us next week. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, Five Great Debates of the End Times, which answer the questions, do ISIS and Iran have anything to do with end time events? When will the tribulation begin? And how long will it last? Which nations does the prophet Ezekiel predict will come against Israel in the last days? And is it possible that the Antichrist will be a Muslim? What about replacement theology? Has the church really replaced Israel as the recipient of God's promises and blessings? Will the Jewish temple be rebuilt on the Temple Mount before Jesus' return? And will America be involved in the Battle of Armageddon? The three programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of only $49. We are also offering a second series entitled The Biblical Case for the Rapture of All Christians. You will learn why millions of Christians will suddenly be missing from the earth to meet Jesus in the air and be taken to heaven. Second, why the power of world leadership will shift away from the United States to Europe. And third, how a world leader will arise and proclaim he can bring peace and stability to the world. And fourth, why the rapture will happen before the tribulation events begin. The three programs in this series are also available for a gift of $49. And if you wish to have both series together, all six half-hour programs are available for a gift of $98. Now, one last thing. I'd really like for you to be able to give these prophecy programs to your friends as a gift. So please listen. When you buy the first package for $98, I'll make each additional package available to you for only $10 per package. So if you buy one extra package containing all six programs, it'll cost you only $10 more. Five more packages will cost you only $50 more. Ten more packages will cost only $100 more. I want this biblical prophecy information to be spread around to your friends, who I believe will be thrilled to get these programs from you as a gift. If this is something that you'd like to do, would you please call us right now and tell one of our operators how many of these packages you want. Our toll-free line is 1-800-805. 3030.